Welcome, everybody. Landowners in England and Wales have been given the green light to open a campsite for 56 days this year without the need for planning permission. If you've been thinking of diversifying and the idea of a campsite or a glamp site appeals to you, then this is an ideal opportunity to dip your toe in the water and to give it a trial run. As part of our Helpful Folk webinar series, we've partnered with PitchUp and today they will explain this unique opportunity as well as what you need to consider to open and run a pop-up tent campsite. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Alex from PitchUp. Thank you, Alex. Can you hear me? Yes, Alex, we can. Perfect. Hi there, everyone. My name is Alexander Russell and I work for pitchup.com. Uh, if we can just move to the next slide. Pitchup.com was founded in 2008 by uh, my managing director, um, Daniel Yates. He actually founded a uh, pop-up campsite himself back in 2000 uh, and worked previously at lastminute.com. Um, I previously worked at Groupon for many years and then started as head of sales in 2017. Um, and uh, my head of uh, accounts actually used to work for Secret Escapes. Um, Daniel Yates used to previously work at lastminute.com. So we've all got, I suppose, a background in travel and leisure. Um, as well as online OTA travel uh, companies. Next slide. So a little bit of background about the company. Um, we have over four and a half thousand campsites and pop up campsites on our website at the moment, um, listed in over 67 countries. Last year we had over 22 million, million annual visitors to our website and sold over three million annual nights. Um, we have customers in 117 countries. Uh, and our website is translated into 17 languages uh, in over 22 currencies. We are one of the uh, 90 companies to win the Financial Times 1000 fastest growing companies in Europe as well. Next slide. So on our website, we have a lot of different types of accommodation from your standard glamping uh, units, yurts, teepees, bell tents uh, to the mobile homes, uh, lodges, camping pods, as well as your standard kind of motorhome and touring caravan pitches, uh, as well as your traditional tents. Uh, in addition to this, we have all sorts of things in other countries, as well as things like glass igloos in Sweden and tree houses in South Africa, but the, I suppose the main core of our business is uh, these sort of types of units in the UK. Next slide. Uh, over the last 13 months, due to the obviously the pandemic uh, and the government making the changes of 56 day permitted development rights, we've had a huge amount of businesses that have obviously been benefiting from this. Um, from uh, landowners to castles to fisheries, pubs, um, race courses, showgrounds, but predominantly there's been a huge benefit to farmers and sort of landowners uh, to really take advantage of this uh, 56 day permitted development rights is kind of what we're here to talk about. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the bookings over the last uh, two years. So as you can see from last year, there was a huge dip uh, in bookings through the um, uh, lockdown through from sort of February to May and then a huge spike uh, after lockdown was released uh, and then a very elongated sort of season as you can see from September to October, November uh, bookings in September were actually higher than the uh, sort of they've ever been before um, and we're actually tracking at the moment about 200% up on last year's um, bookings. So at the moment it's uh, it's extremely busy uh, for outdoor accommodation. Next slide. This just shows the difference in some of the uh, impact maybe across uh, different types of accommodation. So as you can see, Airbnb and Expedia and bookings, they tend to focus on the hotels, um, apartments, that kind of stuff. Um, they have been seriously impacted, obviously, over the last sort of 13 months, whereas the impact to uh, pitch up has been sort of very minimal. Um, in England, we actually saw a 9% increase in bookings and revenue generated last year, even though there was a huge amount. We were, we were in sort of lockdowns for kind of four or five months last year. Um, so there was a huge, obviously, boost to outdoor accommodation and people taking staycations. 
this is, I think, quite an interesting slide. What this basically represents, um, which we were calculating the other week, is that all that we need for a to have to represent a 20% increase in the amount of inventory that we would require uh, in this country for domestic caravanning or camping is just a 2% switch from people taking a holiday abroad previously uh, to then doing something in the domestic, obviously in the UK, uh, and camping and caravanning. Um, obviously, 2% is a very, very small amount for people to switch from taking a holiday abroad, and this this year, obviously, we're expecting it to be a huge amount more than 2%, hence why we, the huge demand in, in, um, in accommodation at the moment for this type of stuff. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, bookings are currently about 200% uh, up versus 2019, um, which obviously 2019 was an extremely good year for us uh, and for bookings in general. So I think it kind of really does demonstrate kind of how and the fact that we've been in lockdown for the last kind of four months, uh, I think it really just does demonstrate how eager people are to get sort of out to the outdoor accommodation and sort of out into the outdoors and get back to nature really. Next slide. So this is what we're really here to talk about um, is the 56 day permitted development rights. Um, what basically the government have done is last year uh, in July, they basically doubled the 56 day permitted development rights from 28 days to 56 days for tented accommodation. This essentially means that anyone with any spare land can open up for 56 days until the end of this year um, with a basically unlimited tented accommodation. You're basically just governed by the amount of acreage that you have um, until the end of this year with no licensing or planning or anything at all. Um, in addition to this, you also have 28 days um, of motorhomes and caravans uh, that you can have. If you have five acres or more, you can have up to three motorhomes or caravans. Um, if we move to the next slide, these are just some of the growing, um, I suppose, some of the factors uh, that are really pushing outdoor accommodation at the moment. Um, obviously, sustainability concerns. I mean, there's a huge amount of people um, who are obviously used to be reliant on air travel who currently now are not. Um, and obviously that's led to a huge boost in the staycation market. Um, the one thing that no one is really talking about at the moment, which is a bit of a gray area, is the affordability. Um, there's a huge amount of people that have been very, very negatively impacted by COVID over the last 13 months. Uh, some family members personally, uh, who have just basically been calling me over the last couple of weeks saying, listen, Alex, we can't afford to take our kids to our three children to potentially Spain or Mallorca or Portugal this summer. Um, due to finances, um, we need to find something in the UK that's affordable that they can do. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the huge reasons why we're seeing a big boost, not only with all the uncertainty with booking uh, something abroad at the moment. I think that's leading to a to a lot of um, people not having much confidence is the word I'm looking for uh, to make a booking abroad. Um, obviously, there's the lure of the countryside. People have been in lockdowns for four, five, six months sometimes, um, and they basically the first thing that everyone did in July last year when everyone was let out of lockdown was jump in their caravans or jump in their cars and get straight into the outdoors and back into the countryside. Um, so it's something obviously that people are wanting to do. Um, and then the final thing I think is what's so great about this and giving such a great boost to this uh, industry is the different types of accommodation and different types of businesses that are now I suppose taking advantage of this. So previously where customers could only take advantage of a, a standard campsite uh, that had been in existence for sort of 30 years or 15 years and had been sort of an well established um, and kind of bread and butter. They're now being able to go to castles and farms and, and fisheries and all sorts of activity centers and really pubs and I mean any sort of business can take advantage of this. So I think it's really widened the, uh, the sort of options for people to book. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, obviously people are, this is why people are wanting to do this, is getting back to nature. Um, there's a sense of relaxation, health and well-being that people get, um, as, not to mention the afford affordability that I already went through. Um, there's a huge amount, I suppose, of people that have been, as, uh, mental health is something that I think has been very negatively impacted over the last 13 months. And there was a, as you can see on there, there's a survey that was done, which uh, was done from a, some, um, customers that attended a campsite and they basically about 40% of them were saying that they did more exercise, they felt more relaxed, they felt less stressed and in general they felt happier. So I think an overall all round for people's mental health, I think outdoor accommodation and this type of stuff is extremely beneficial. Next slide. So this is basically what I was discussing and there's a, quite a bit of information on this slide. Uh, so don't worry, this one and the next one will be, all this information will be sent out. So do not worry too much. Um, but what we're really here to talk about is the number one thing there, which is the permitted development rights, which is the 56 day extension. Uh, 
until the end of the year for tented accommodation. So as I mentioned, you've got 56 days until the end of the year, which you can open up for tented accommodation. So you can, in theory, put up your own bell tents if you wanted to, as an example, or in what most cases, what most sites are doing is just allowing people to come put up their own tents on their land. Um, to give you a rough idea, the average tent size pitch is about 22 feet square, so about seven meters square. Um, in addition to this, you also have um, 28 days, which, as I said, if you have more than five acres, you can have up to three motomes or caravans. Uh, the tented accommodation, they're slightly separate. The tented accommodation is sort of unlimited. You're basically governed by the amount of acreage that you have and suitable flat land, I suppose. So it's a case of working out how many 22 feet squares you can basically fit on the suitable land that you have, giving a good, I don't know, two meter socially distance between each one. Um, and that would be then your kind of, I suppose, maximum capacity of the amount of tents that you could have. Um, the motomes and caravans for 28 days is slightly different. Whether you have a thousand acres or whether you have five acres, you can only have three motomes or caravans. If you have less than five acres, you can only have one motome or caravan. Um, we work with uh, any sort of business, any sort of landowner can do this. We work with national parks, AONBs, the only sites that do have to check with their national, uh, with their local authority and get approval is triple SI rated sites. Um, but apart from that, uh, and we do actually work with some of them, they have got approval, but it's just if you are triple SI rated, which there aren't very many, um, but if you are, you would have to get just an approval from your council to be able to do it. Um, but apart from that, there's really, very, very few restrictions on anyone doing this. The only thing you would need is public liability insurance, which a lot of sites already have. But if it's something you don't have, that is the only thing legally you do need to have. Um, apart from that, it's very, I suppose, relaxed in terms of what you need to do. Um, the other two options on here that we I'll just touch on is obviously full planning um, and then the exempt organizations. So um, last year we had quite a number of sites going, doing the pop-up campsite. Then made a lot of money or it was very successful and then wanted to either go the full planning route and open up as a proper full campsite for 365 days of the year um quite substantial site probably um or they if they wanted to keep it much smaller there and maybe as a limit for an example of maybe something like 10 tents and five motomes or caravans uh they could go the exempt organization route and exempt organizations are about seven or eight in the uk and they'll come out and basically give you a license to operate on a very sort of reduced capacity basis um but it's something i suppose as ian said earlier it's a very good way of dipping your toe in the water to try the 56 day permitted development rights so then potentially if you wanted to if it works Obviously, you can then potentially look at either going the exempt organization route or the full planning route if you'd like. Next slide. This is, as I mentioned, quite a detailed graph of basically what I've just gone through there, uh, which essentially what it's saying, and it basically just runs through what I've just said on the previous slide, and we won't pause on it for too long because it's quite detailed and it is something is sort of more to refer to. Um, but essentially, if you have, if you want to do more than 56 days of tents, you would need to either go the exempt organization route or apply for a license. And if you wanted to do more than 28 days of caravans or motomes, you would again need to go down the planning or exempt organization route. Um, Next slide. This is quite interesting. So these are the peak arrival days uh, for when most people are arriving. And this is taken from 2019 because obviously last year was a bit skewed in terms of dates. Um, but as you can see, the most peak arrival dates across the year in a normal year would be the May bank holidays uh, and then July and August with the August bank holiday being obviously a peak um, time for bookings. Um, what a lot of sites are doing, so the 56 days uh, does not have to be done consecutively. Um, there is a little caveat here, which is basically if you want to do in all in one go and not have any breaks or anything. Uh, you can only do 42 days consecutively and then you have to close for one day and then you can reopen. Um, but you just have to, if you want to do it consecutively, you can only do 42 days and then you have to close. I think it's a day that you need to let the land rest. Um, most sites that we work with are usually, what they'll do is there are, uh, they'll open up for weekends across June, July and August and they'll add days either side of them. So as an example, there are 12 weekends in June, July and August. So that's 24 days. They'll then add maybe a Friday and a Monday either side of those weekends. Um, and then they'll add days either side of the bank holiday and they'll use up their 56 day allowance that way. So they're kind of, I suppose, maximizing the peak arrival weekends and things like that. Um, next slide. Oh, this is just to show the kind of, I suppose, the search history of the, and what people are actually looking for at the moment. And I think it's just to kind of 
give some confidence to the fact that uh, I think sometimes in the news when everyone's sort of reading anything in the newspaper whether it be kind of any form of newspaper they're always if they're ever referring to camping or outdoor accommodation it's always tends to be glamping uh, I think it tends to be because the it is probably the most aesthetically pleasing thing for people to read about um, but actually when it actually comes to crunch the bread and butter of what people are actually booking uh, is actually caravanning and general tented accommodation just camping uh, and basic stuff like that so it just I suppose just give you a bit of a context of what the most bookings are coming through for each uh, each content um, each pitch type next slide so this is going on the left hand side we are trying to give you here the um, average pitch types the pricing for each thing so the average price on our website for tented accommodation is between 23 to 26 pounds um, and a motorhome is generally between 27 and 33 um, obviously depending if it's grass or electric and things like that um, the tented accommodation um, obviously does depend on the facilities so we do have some sites that are doing kind of I suppose slightly more wild camping shall we say um, and have very limited facilities maybe they don't have showers maybe they didn't even have toilets um, and they're offering maybe 10 or 15 pounds a night for a 10 pitch or something like that as an example um, but the average on our website is around about kind of 25 pounds um, Average sites last year earned about twelve and a half thousand pounds uh, in the period of July and August because obviously they're only open for that kind of eight week period. Um, we did have some sites that were earning well over sort of fifty thousand pounds and some that earned over a hundred thousand um, pounds. The I suppose the as I mentioned the, the, the average size tent pitch is, is about seven meters square and twenty two feet. Um, so I suppose it's a it's a kind of a, a case of sort of trying to work out how many tent tents you can get on that space or how many motomes potentially you can get um, if you do have five acres or more. Um, and then yeah, and then we can see kind of what the potential revenue you could generate is. Um, but there's a huge amount of potential revenue to generate from this currently. Um, next slide. In terms of toilets and showers, as I mentioned, there is, I suppose, no legislation at the moment to say you need to have a certain amount of toilets or you need a certain amount of showers or really the legislation is very grey at the moment and very kind of lax. Um, the only legislation regarding toilets and showers at the moment is that if you have shared toilets or shower facilities, they cannot, op uh, they must be cleaned regularly. Uh, there is not even legislation to say how often that is. Um, we had quite a few sites last year actually uh, and some this year who were doing more kind of wild camping um, so some of them and they do more I suppose they um, appeal more to the hardened bear grills type campers the ones with their pop-up toilet tents and uh, solar panel showers and things like that that they'll bring with them so it's I suppose not as um, not as widespread and popular um, but we did have some sites going live last year with very like almost no toilets no showers no water and just had somewhere to put their uh, rubbish and they had to bring everything with them i wouldn't recommend it because as i said it doesn't really appeal to most people um and i probably wouldn't do it personally this is basically what we recommend um and it's just a, a rough guidance to say if you have 60 10 pitches we would recommend four toilets for women and two for men uh, and two showers for men and two for women to give you a rough idea of what i suppose some guidance i suppose because there is really no legislation to say what you should have uh, the other things to mention would be the things that i would think about is safe drinking water if there's somewhere you can provide drinking water and also somewhere for them to put their rubbish or their waste uh, those are really the toilets and showers waste and um, water are the kind of three i suppose main things if you kind of can do those things then everything else is i suppose an easy thing to do um, the as i mentioned before Public liabilities insurance is the only thing legally that you need to have. Um, and then the only other uh, thing is there's some NHS um, track and trace um, stuff that you have to, um, a poster that you have to uh, display and also some uh, track and trace details that you have to collect. But apart from that, it's there's some co obviously very basic COVID stuff, but it's uh, apart from the public liability insurance, uh, there really isn't anything that you legally need to do. Um, we do ask some sites that on the day that they open, they would maybe let their local authority know uh, that they are opening, but you don't have to, it's not legally, you don't have to do that. That's more of just a gesture of good faith. Uh, next slide. Just some general bits here now. Um, a lot of the sites that we work with obviously are farms or activity centers and sometimes or restaurants and bars and pubs and all sorts of businesses and very often they have incremental ways of making additional revenue from these 
people while they're on site. At the end of the day, they're kind of, I suppose, predisposed to be spending money with you while they're there. So they may only be spending 25 pounds on a tent pitch for the night, but they may be having 100, 150 pounds in their pocket. Um, and they would much rather get organic eggs or bacon or milk or cheese or anything potentially like that that you might be able to buy or any sort of activity. I had a site the other day that was backing up animal feed and selling the animal feed to the kids so they could go and feed the animals. And he thought he'd reinvented the wheel. Um, so there's quite a few different things. I mean, anything that you can potentially think about monetizing. I had another site that was looking at doing, uh, but he was a very avid bird watcher. So he was taking people on excursions and bird watching, things like that and charging them. And I had another lady who was doing um, artistry and doing painting and people and doing courses and things while people were there. So there's many things that you can think about, I suppose, to monetize, uh, to make incremental revenue while they're there. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, just a couple of things that you can think about, obviously hampers potentially, obviously the organic produce. Um, I actually had a site the other day who was um, selling uh, log uh, wooden uh, wood for their uh, log burners and things like that. So or their cookers and things like that. So there is plenty of options for you. Next slide. So how do we work? So basically we are essentially the booking.com for outdoor accommodation. Uh, customers come onto our website, they will find your listing, they will click to make a booking, and at the time of booking, you will get an email confirmation with all the details of the booking, and they will get an email confirmation with all the details of the booking. Um, it's a very, very simple process. If we can move to the next slide just quickly. There are no sign up fees, there's no joining fees, there's no monthly costs, there's no exclusivity clauses, there's no contractual tie in periods. There is, because with the market leader, there is, it's, there's basically nothing apart from just a commission per booking. So we charge 15% per booking or 12.5% if you're VAT registered, because you can claim back 2.5% from the taxman. Um, how it would work, as I said, is someone comes onto a website, they click to make a booking, you will get all the details on an email and also a text message notification if you'd like. Um, and the customer will get a uh, an email with all the details of the booking. At that point, if you were charging, let's say for argument's sake, £20 a night for a tent pitch, uh, we would take a £3 deposit at the time of booking, which is 15%, which works as a deposit and also as commission. And then we would transfer you usually in advance prior to the customer arriving the £17 balance of that £20 booking. Um, it's a very, very simple system to use. Um, if we move to the next slide. One thing about uh, the way you can set up your listing is that it's completely customizable. So if you wanted to tailor it, so you only wanted adults, no dogs, no children, uh, you can do that. If you wanted to allow groups and parties and um, you can do that as well. Uh, you can make it, I suppose, exactly how you'd want it. You want it to be uh, and you can kind of attract those people. Um, I suppose it's a good thing because then not all sites are doing the same thing and it'd be boring if everyone offered exactly the same. Uh, offering, but it, we do have very often uh, obviously a lot of farms and things who have animals, so they need to obviously they can't always have dogs on site and things like that. So we are uh, it is totally customizable, however, you'd like to make it. Next slide. So just a little bit about how we work. Um, so as I mentioned, obviously you can sign up on our website. It's very, very simple. Um, we will then give you login details to your portal where you can then start adding images, uh, a description about the surrounding area um, and your bank details and some general information. Once you've done that, that is basically about 70 or 80 percent of the listing complete. Uh, we will then allocate you an account coordinator who will then get in touch uh, and they'll help you to add in the kind of allocation for what dates you would like to put in uh, and also the pricing and things like that. Uh, and just basically dot the kind of I's, cross the T's and then we'll send it off to our editorial and design team who will then write up the listing uh, and then set it live. Um, I, one thing I always say to sites is one of the most important things is imagery. Uh, imagery is extremely important. Um, the more images you can provide and there's no limit on them on our website, um, the better. People are very visual now. Um, one thing also to mention is if you do have a booking system, we can integrate with your booking system because we integrate with about 90 different booking systems. Um, and also if you happen to be um, uh, using, you can also link your uh, bookings to your Google Calendar as well if you'd like. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned before, you can get the payment in arrival if you'd like. About 60% of the campsites to 70% of them and actually now it's gone a bit up recently because of COVID and people would rather actually not have to take uh, or don't want to take payment on arrival. Um, so about 70% of our campsites now will actually take uh, payment in advance. So you can decide, as I said, when we transfer you the remaining balance, let's say it's a £17 balance of a £20 booking, you can decide how far in advance you'd like that payment. Uh, it goes anywhere from 12 weeks in advance uh, all the way up until payment on arrival on the day if you so choose. 
Uh, I would say most sites choose, if they do choose a payment in advance, it's usually around about four to six weeks is the average. Uh, but as I said, about 30% of sites are still accepting payment on arrival because some of them want to just, I don't know, meet people on site and, and kind of press the flesh, I suppose. Um, next slide. One thing that we're doing with all of our bookings is we're sending out the countryside code with a confirmation with all our bookings, I think. And we're trying to um, campaign the government at the moment very hard to uh, communicate a bit more information about the countryside code because they haven't actually spent a huge amount of money since I think about 1980 actually communicating this. Um, but it's something that we're sending out with all of our uh, booking confirmations at the moment because there's probably what well, we expect there's going to be millions of people traveling from cities and things to, into the countryside this year on staycations that potentially have never ever been before. Uh, so that's something that we're doing. Next slide. Uh, we also offer the, uh, you can download an app and you can actually get it onto your mobile phone and you can actually manage the bookings from your mobile if you happen to get like walk-ins on the day, just randoms uh, and things like that. Uh, so that can also be done. Um, next slide. One thing as I mentioned earlier uh, and it's something we've uh, enabled for because a lot of the landowners and farmers that we work with sometimes don't have always the best Wi-Fi connection. Um, we also enable so you get an email confirmation, but you can also uh, ask for a text message as well uh, in addition to the email uh, so you'll never kind of, I suppose, miss a booking. Um, and you can also, as I mentioned earlier, you can uh, attach this to your Google Calendar so your pitch up bookings pull directly into that. Um, next slide. One thing to mention is obviously when you're setting up your listing, you can decide when you would like people to arrive and also when people you would like people to depart. Um, I did actually a webinar the other week and actually there was a couple of pop up campsites who listed with us last year um, and a little bit of the feedback to the things that they said actually one of them was on arrival times and they said whatever arrival time that you ask or you set let's say it's 12 o'clock expect people to turn up slightly earlier uh, people will always set off a little bit early people obviously because if they've got tents and things they will always want to maybe arrive slightly earlier to put those up um, but generally people will whatever time you set to arrive people will bear in mind that people will potentially arrive a little bit earlier. Um, the other thing that they mentioned, which was good feedback actually, was that a lot of them numbered out pitches and actually marked out pitches last year and said, well, we're going to have them kind of all done like that. Uh, and actually on the webinar that I did the other week, they actually said that the feedback was that they weren't going to do that this year and they were just going to let people kind of, I suppose, um, kind of socially distance themselves and kind of find where they'd like to kind of put their pit, temp pitch up, <coughs> excuse me, um, because it was just easier and it was an easy way to manage it rather than having to almost play Tetris because sometimes you might get a booking from a family and then maybe a, a, their husband or wife books under a different name and they arrive at different times and you haven't put them next to each other and all of a sudden you've got to kind of move people around. So the general consensus and feedback from most of the pop-up sites was numbered and kind of marked out pitches weren't the best way thing to do. Um, next slide. Oh, this is just a bit of general, um, I suppose, overview of some of the demographic that we have on our website that are booking, um, which I think is quite interesting that actually almost 60% of people booking aren't actually don't have any children at all. Uh, so it tends to be couples, the majority of the people. Um, and also the people that do have children uh, on the right hand side uh, of those people that are booking, only about 13% of them are, are kind of preschool age, so infants. Um, so it's not kind of going to be hundreds of kind of screaming babies or anything on site if that was something that you guys were potentially worried about or concerned. Um, next slide. We have about six or seven PR international PR agencies across the world at the moment. So obviously they've been getting a huge amount of press and I think that the staycation surge as you can see there with the, the Sun's article on surge and staycation books leaves. UK campsites full, so farmers are now opening their fields to campers from £17 a night. I think that kind of sums up the what m the press has really been sort of hammering recently is the huge, I suppose, push on staycations this year. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, the uncertainty around international travel and also the cost factor of potential um, PCR tests or isolation or um, quarantining when you arrive and things like that. I think it's kind of putting off a lot of people who even potentially have had their, um, their two vaccines this year. So it's, uh, I think we're seeing a lot more about it in the press. And as you know, if you scroll to the next slide, actually, there's even more uh, that we've had recently um, in all sorts of stuff. Obviously, Sunday Times, Metro, we were in the Telegraph yesterday. Um, I think this is pushing a huge amount at the moment on the staycation side of things. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, these are just a couple of uh, testimonials that you can read from uh, some of the pop-up campsites that we listed last year. Uh, the top one there, actually, Girt Down Farm, uh, they've actually listed their second. They've actually got another site that they're actually listing with us. Uh, and this is actually just something I wanted to touch on just now, which is that the 56-day permitted development rights is based on the parcels of land. Uh, so this goes two ways. So if you have two different locations and they're completely separate, one in, I don't know, Cornwall and one in Gloucestershire or something, you can basically open up two different sites either at the same time and do 56 six days at both at the same time, or you can do one and then the other. Um, I actually had a landowner the other day who we checked into this, what well, was about a couple of months ago, they looked into it, they had about 300 acres and they found out that they looked into it and they found that they're actually comprised of three different parcels of land that actually meant that they could actually open up three separate campsites, either all at the same time or one after the other. Uh, so it is based on the wording is the parcel of land. So if you, if you do have a large land holding, then it's something to have a think about. Um, the last one at the bottom actually there I think is quite interesting, which was just a pub and I think that kind of highlights some of the additional revenue and incremental revenue that can be made uh, from these people while they're on site, which was he said he was saying that 50% of the customers were spending around £100 in their bar and restaurant. Um, they're kind of, as I said, predisposed to be spending money while, with, their, with you while they're there. So if there is anything that you can think about monetizing, then it is a really good thing to do. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just a video that we don't actually have time to sort of play you now, but we will obviously be included in all the slides and everything that we will send out afterwards. Uh, and it's just a video of a farm that is obviously was live with us last year and a kind of some of their experiences and how they kind of bookings went and how they've managed things. Uh, I think it's just quite useful uh, for people to have a look at. So we will include that in the uh, in the slides. That's most of the information that I wanted to run through. I obviously want to thank everyone for um, taking the time to have a listen to all the information. Obviously, all of our contact details are on this uh, on this page and if obviously will be shared with you afterwards. Uh, and then I will, uh, I think that's everything for me. So I will pass back and see if there's uh, any questions that we may have. Thank you, Alex. That was that was very informative. Um, we do have a couple of questions before we get to them, though. Um, I just noted that on a on our previous webinar, you did uh, give some advice on what types of images uh, people like to see. Are you able just to elaborate a bit here? Yes, yes. So the type of imagery, so I, as an example, I had a site, a farm who I contacted a while ago and I spoke to them uh, and they signed up to our website. When I actually saw their images, I was like, oh, they've only got four pictures and they're all of the, the same view of the same field of where they'd be camping. Uh, and I called them and I said, just quickly, um, I was just wondering, why you've only got the four pictures and they were like oh we just thought they people would want to see where they're camping and I said listen you've got they actually had llamas on site they had a, almost like a petting zoo of animals uh, they had uh, a like a river stream going through their uh, some of their fields I mean it was absolutely stunning and I was like you've missed all of this you could almost have taken pictures of all of that stuff and not taken a picture of where they'd actually be camping and that would actually have almost been better uh, there were going to be so many uh, sites on our website with pictures of green fields and I suppose a lot of what people are going to do is not just sit in the green field it's to go and see what's what's in the surrounding area what's on site what is what is nearby so if there's something of historical significance or a nice pub nearby or even like an activity center just down the road those, these are things that we want to highlight because that's obviously what people are generally going to campsites for it's the, to enjoy the surrounding areas as well okay that's that's great thank you okay so to the questions that we've received um, the first is does permitted development mean I can just go ahead and set up a new campsite without contacting any authorities? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you're not legally obliged to let anyone at a, legal, uh, at a local authority know. Uh, you are obviously the only legal obligation is that you have public liability insurance. Um, we do ask and it's more of a gesture of good faith that sites, if they are the day that they're opening, will just ping their local authority or give them a quick call or send them an email, just let them know we are opening, but you don't have to do that. That's, uh, a as I said, a gesture of good faith. Um, you don't, you're not legally obliged to, to do anything apart from the public liability insurance. Okay, great, thank you. Am I limited to any specific size of campsite? Uh, no, no, you're not. You're not limited. You're the, I suppose the limit, as I mentioned earlier, is really based on the number of, so it's kind of a, a case of looking at the, I suppose, suitable flat land that you've got uh, and kind of working out roughly how many 22 foot squares or how many seven meter squares could you get on that suitable flat land and then that kind of, I suppose, works out your maximum capacity of what you could take in terms of tented accommodation. But there is, with the tented stuff, someone who has one acre, let's say they're having 10 tents, someone who has a thousand acres can have 
thousand times that amount. Um, whereas the motorhomes and caravans is very limited. It's whether you've got five acres or 5,000 acres, it doesn't matter. You can only have three motorhomes or caravans. And if you have less than five acres, you can only have one. But the tented accommodation is basically unlimited, depending okay. on how much acreage you have. Great, that was nice and clear. Thank you. Um, this next question, I'm not sure if it's one really for you or for Ian. Um, what about my basic payment scheme application I sent in earlier this month? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start, Barry, and um, Alex might have a bit more up-to-date um, information than I've got, but my understanding is when it was a 28-day permitted development, um, it was the basic payment scheme was still paid on that on the area you were using. Um, I'm not sure I can't really work out now what the view is on the 56 day. I've I've read that a um, they're not going to pay on the if it's out of if the farm's out of production for 56 days. Um, so I'm I'm not really sure. Obviously, application for BPS have gone in. So I think my only consideration would be considering how much land might be involved, it should definitely be a worth a call to the RPA because you might end up paying more fines than the area payment was worth. So I don't know, Alex, you might have a bit I, I, more. The only information I know is that I've, I was on a webinar the week and they, the, the advice was to contact, if, you have, if you're slightly concerned about it, I would contact, um, is the R, did you say it was the RPS? Uh, the Rural Payments Agency, yeah. yeah. yeah then I would just I would touch base them to see if it might affect it. OK, thank you. Uh, last question. This is one for folk to folk actually, Ian, so one for you. I assume folk to folk lends money for setting up campsites. Um, if so, how quickly can you organise the money? Um, well, the first part, yes, we, we are actively involved in setting up campsites and glamping sites and basically any other farm diversification um, that you could really think of. Our minimum loan is 100,000 and that is secured against land and property against a, a loan to value, a maximum loan to value of 60%. Um, we, we use the term payments, uh, money, sorry, borrowings can be available um, in weeks, not months. It all depends on getting the right information. Obviously, we involve solicitors, uh, valuers can come into it, and it's just getting all the information back. I mean, very recently, we had a case where a million pound plus deal went through in, in less than a fortnight, but it was just because everything came in absolutely on time. Perfect. Thank you, Ian. Um, that's the end of our questions. Well, can, so, uh, Marian, could I just ask one more question of Alex? Of course, of course. Go ahead. Um, Alex, I'm just thinking from a working farmer's point of view, um, I might, if I was going to do this, I might think, well, yeah, obviously I want people at weekends because that's a peak time for people being away. But to work in with the farm, I might want to say, OK, I want everybody gone on Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. and I don't want anybody back in again until Thursday night to give me time to farm, if you like, um, mm -hmm. without any 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 public people around. Um, I know you can sort that on on the app and that for doing. But one thing I have heard um, and read is that within within the um, if you're doing a, a 56 day, if you have breaks, you have to clear building. If you've got a portable loo or portable shower or whatever, if you, if you actually have a break in those 56 days, you have to clear the site. Technically, okay. you have technically te technically you have to remove any structures like that from the site while it's not being used. And, and how rigid is that? Because, you know, I mean, would that on my scenario, would that mean I've got to clear everything on Tuesday morning and then bring it back again on Thursday night? Technically, this is what sites are doing, but I don't, I mean, I'm not going down to these sites. I don't know how many of them are actually doing this. Um, I can't imagine most of them are taking everything off. Some of them said, because obviously some of the um, 
uh, portable loo companies will actually come and pick them up and take them away and, and drop them back and things like that. So it's not such of an issue. But I do know a couple of sites that I don't think are, are removing their tents every weekend if they've got a bell tent and then taking it down and then putting it back up on the Monday. I think they're just leaving it there on 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 a, on a unattended uh, which is technically not against the rules but i mean i had sites last year i think there's a lot there's a lot of gray area here and also there's very there's very few people out there being able to manage this i mean whose responsibility is it would you say to go out i mean is it the local authority do they have the capacity to go out and check that every single person is almost like we saw a lot of sites almost kind of going over their 56 days last year um as well because it it's very difficult to manage um exactly how many days somebody has been open potentially um one of the things that actually I was, you kind of jogged my memory about something which I was going to mention, which came up on a webinar the other day, which I think might be quite useful, is basically how to manage it. Uh, and I had a question which was, how can we manage this because we're not on the site all the time? Or actually, the bit of land that we had isn't actually anywhere near to where we live. Um, as an example, I had a site last year uh, that was a farm and how it was actually two, well, two different ones. I've got two examples. What one was what they did was they basically had a gate uh, and on the gate they basically put a coded lock, which at the time of booking they would send the code uh, to the people uh, who were booking. So when they arrived, they just opened the gate, they closed it behind them and actually they only went down to the site about twice a week. Um, just to make sure that the portable toilets were being serviced and the rubbish was being put in the rubbish bins and things like that. And there was no kind of disruptions or anything. Uh, and they would come back kind of two days later. Um, I even had another site which was um, he used to go down there once a week. But every day he would get his son to fly over a drone over the top of the um, the campsite to make sure that people were kind of putting rubbish in bins and things were kind of looked all in place. Um, so it, I suppose in terms of management of it, you don't have to, I suppose, be on site all day, every day. It's not like you've got to sit there kind of greeting people and meeting people. You can do if you want, um, but it can be, I suppose, managed remotely. Thank you. I'm just aware of the time because we're on time now, but we've just had two more questions and one comment coming in and they look quite they look quite juicy. So I think we'll, we'll try and squeeze them in. Firstly, we've had a comment from uh, Jane Harrison from the CLA. Thank you, Jane, advising that over 28 days, the entitlement should not be claimed on the land being used for the campsite. So uh, there's a bit of clarity there from the CLA. Thank you. Um, more questions. Uh, we have one here saying, are there any regulations for ponds on site or fires on site? Any health and safety concerns? I would say with, for ponds, there would probably we have actually quite a few sites. I've got a couple that have actually got um, like uh, where they could be able to go swimming and things. And they've said they will put up a sign saying that obviously children should be kept an eye on. But there is, I suppose, no legal legislation to say if you have water on site, you must have I don't know, life jackets available and there's nothing to say that if you have a fire pitch, you need a fire extinguisher on site that it's, I suppose, a bit of common sense, I think, is more sort of leading that than legislation. OK, thank you. Um, final question. <clears throat> it would be good to discuss how wild is wild camping. I'm thinking about a parcel of land, pleasant Cotswold meadows and woodland, but no facilities whatsoever at present. Rough and ready. <laughs> That's just the farmer. <laughs> That's uh, to be honest. I mean, as I said earlier, we had some sites doing that last year. I had one in the uh, in Exmoor who actually was very, very popular and he had no water, no toilets, no showers. And he literally just had bins in a field and people just were there. They did get bookings. It wasn't as popular, um, but it it is still an option. I mean, as I said, people there, you do have these hardened Bear grills type people who kind of go to go do wild camping in Scotland in March. Uh, these people do exist. Then it's not my type of holiday. I probably wouldn't want to do that in the rain and the in the in the sideways wind. Um, but obviously they they do exist and they and they're kind of more than well versed in having their pop up toilet tents and their and their inf and bringing their water with them and their stove and all the stuff that they need for kind of be completely self sufficient while they're. And I'll, I'll come in on here if I may, Varian, because I, I'm, I've got a, a connection up in actually up in Northumberland um, and that it is is wild camping. And literally you arrive at the farm and you're given a shovel and a mat. I mean, that is the extreme that people go mm. and it is very popular. It's very popular um, and, and it's one of the very few places um, in that area where you are allowed to have a, a natural campfire. Um, it's so, so it, it's all sorts that can that can come into this. 
I was actually on a webinar the other day and actually one other thing that just kind of ties into that is that actually a, a landowner was worried that there would be they were like oh well would people not want to book because we don't have toilets and showers and things like that and actually one of the other uh, pop-up campsites who did it last year and said actually they had quite a few people even though they had toilets and they got portable toilets in that quite a few people turned up and wouldn't use them um, not because they were rubbish and because they smelt, but because they actually didn't want to, because of COVID, they didn't want to mix with other people and touch anything or have their kids do anything. And they were actually brought their own pop-up toilet tent and their own equipment and their own sort of facilities and stuff anyway. Um, so they were kind of, they almost went to the campsite um, sort of set up to be kind of looked after or completely sort of self-contained, even though they had showers and toilets and things like that anyway. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. That's some fantastic information there. I really enjoyed that. Uh, Ian, handing back to you to wrap up, please. Thank you, Alex. Um, a very informative and, and interesting session, and we do appreciate that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if any, there are any further questions from Alex, um, contact him by the email, which is showing on your screen now. Um, here at folk to folk we'd be very happy to discuss um, whether you anything that any questions you've got regarding funding for camping ventures or or indeed any other diversification activities and again we can be contacted on the uh, email address on the screen we are running a helpful folk series of webinars and next month um, our webinar will be in partnership with action coach um, who will explain the six ways you can grow your business. An invitation will come to you um, uh, by email shortly and we'd be delighted if you join us um, on that occasion as well. Um, thank you for your time today and from us all, goodbye.